Hello and welcome to part one of our introduction to fire doors. This training program has been brought to you by the BWF Certifier Fire Doors Scheme and I'm here with our scheme manager, John Fletcher. Hi, John. Hi, Tim. John, who needs to know about fire doors? Well, in particular, it needs to be anybody who's in um, anything to do with the supply or installation, the specification, and even the maintenance of fire doors and, and how you check fire doors. There's a lot of people engaged in the process of, of using fire doors, and it's important that everybody understands how they work, how to be maintained, and how to use them correctly. So let's move on to part one, and uh, let's look at this first section. Uh, John, wh why do we need fire doors? Fire doors are part of a building's passive fire protection system. They're a vital component in a building. And it's important then that their correct specification and installation and maintenance are, are, are carried out correctly. They are determined by building regulations and uh, European and British standards as well. And we should view them as a life-saving product. Their function is to save lives and to save property. Mm -hmm. And unless they're installed correctly, then they can't do that work. Uh, one of the things that we find quite often about fire doors is that we, we tend to take them as just being an ordinary door. And in most cases, they operate as an ordinary door. But there are times that a fire might break out. And if that's the case, then we expect them to carry out a totally different role. We expect them to work as they were designed to save lives and save property. And so they should be installed correctly, they should be specified correctly with the correct components. There are two ways in which a building is protected from fire. One is an active system. They are some things such as alarms, fire extinguishers, sprinkler systems that are activated in the event of a fire. But what many people don't recognize is that there is what's called a passive fire system for protecting that building. That includes the way that the walls and um, ceilings are structured, and it includes the fire doors as well. And in order for that building to operate correctly, we need ideally to have a combination of both. People tend to think that it's the active systems that need to be always working correctly and not necessarily think about the passive systems because it's taken for granted that they're part of of that building process and we we tend to overlook the real role of a fire door and and often abuse them so john what's the role of fire doors in passive fire protection it has to close and seal off that particular room that compartment and allow people to escape and so you can imagine that a door has to be tested that it can prove that it can do that role and it can only work correctly when the components that it's supplied with are fitted correctly as well. And those components have got to be compatible with the fire doors test. We'll learn a lot more about this when we look at testing of fire doors in a few more slides time. Ideally, a door should be installed as what's called a door set. A door set is something that's supplied complete with its frame, its seals, its glazed apertures, and all the ironmongery that's fitted, that should be fitted to that door as one single unit, as one complete installation. However, the standard practice that we have in the UK is quite different. What happens is that an installer will go and buy a door leaf, and he will also then buy all the different components that are fitted to that leaf, just as he would hang an ordinary door. Except in this case, it's not an ordinary door, it's a fire door. And so it's very important that those components not only fit the door correctly, but also are in line with that door leaves test evidence. As we'll see later on, that door is tested with all those components. And what you're trying to do when you install the door is to replicate that test. So all of those components need to be CE marked these days, and they need to be certified approved to show that they're compatible with the door test. Why do you think people don't use uh, door sets, complete door sets? It's historic, really. There are lots of thoughts as to why people don't use door sets. Many people think that because the initial cost is high, then they can save money 
by fitting individual components and buy them cheaply. That's not always the case, though. Um, door sets are much easier to install, and they also give you a far better um, control of the, of the role of the fire door. Unfortunately, in this country, it's not the way we've gone about it. And so historically and traditionally, we fit them as we see them in this um, slide here as individual components. It's a practice that we, we need to break out of, really. So if you think of this business of compatibility as being like a jigsaw, think of it that when you want to see a clear picture, you have to get all the components fitted in the right place. So think of it as a jigsaw when you fit in the fire door, that the closes, the frames, the linings, the latches, the hinges, and the intermittent strips should all be the correct pieces that go together to make that door work correctly. So let's um, move into the second section of this first module. What are the regulations that apply to fire doors, John? Okay, the regulations that apply to buildings in the UK are relevant to either new buildings or existing buildings. And you can download these regulations from the planning portal. It's in a, a portal that's online that's uh, run by government departments. So the FIDO regulations that cover new build are in two volumes. The first one is to cover ordinary dwelling houses. By that we mean detached or semi-detached houses, bungalows and other property like that. Volume 2 looks at all the other types of properties not classified as a dwelling house. But that also then covers flats and apartments. They come in Volume 2. They have different rules and regulations depending on the design and layout of a flat or an apartment. The regulations cover a number of different standards that should be adhered to in order to make sure that you use the right products. Uh, in this case, this tells you about the British standards that apply, not just in England and Wales, but also in Northern Ireland and Scotland. In Northern Ireland and Scotland, they're not called approved documents, they're called technical booklets or technical handbooks. And they can also be downloaded from the various websites relevant to Scotland and Northern Ireland. In all cases, though, we all have to apply, uh, work to British standards and that gives a list of different regulations and standards that apply to the products that are contained in the regulations. Mm -hmm. In the UK, there are other regulations that also have an impact on fire doors. The ones that we've just been talking about, Part B, cover fire safety. And they tell you where a fire door is required, what the fire resistance period is, that's required for different parts of the building, and also specific requirements whether you need such things as smoke seals and signage. But there are other regulations that affect sound and ventilation, the thermal performance of, of doors in, in particular buildings, accessibility and safety glazing. And all of those are shown in this table here. In, the UK, in England and Wales, they're known as parts E, F, L, M, or N. Whereas in Scotland or Northern Ireland, they have different sections of their technical handbooks or technical booklets. There is a dilemma sometimes when it comes to these type of regulations because there can be a conflict between the performance required for a fire door and, for example, accessibility and the closer pressures that you have uh, for disabled people going in and out of doors. And it's something that you should pay attention to. Very often, the closing pressures can be quite hard for the disabled person to then be able to push the door from the closed position to open it. There are special types of fire door closers that can be used, and they should be thought of when they're specifying the doors in the first place. Think about the people who are going to use that building and think about the type of closers that should be fitted so that they, they are easier to open and they're specially designed for those sort of applications. And John, who's responsible for making sure these regulations are adhered to? Everybody in the chain is responsible, really, um, right from an architect or another specifier who 
whose job it is to make sure that the doors are correctly shown on the drawings for the building, right through to the installer who must make sure that the doors are installed correctly in accordance with what's shown on those drawings. So if, for example, the door is specified as an FD30S, that means that the architect must make sure that they've got correct smoke seals on those doors and that the installer installs smoke seals to those requirements. Okay, John, so that was uh, the regulations uh, relating to new builds. What about existing buildings? Existing buildings are covered now by a regulation that came out in 2005 and uh, was applicable from 2006. In an England and Wales, it's known as the RRO, the Regulatory Reform Fire Safety Order, and it applies to all premises other than domestic premises. It is important that anybody who owns or manages a building is aware of that particular fire safety order. In Scotland and Northern Ireland, they have very similar fire safety orders that have been passed by their own local government. In England and Wales, there is a connection between the new build regulations and the RRO. It's important under the UK building regulations that people who are handing over a building pass the right information about that building on to the person who is known as the responsible person. The responsible person is someone who is responsible for ensuring that fire, correct fire risk assessments are carried out in that building. In the case of fire doors, we would expect you to pass on fire certification relating to each fire door assembly, and that includes the essential ironmongering seals and glazing and any other information that's provided by the manufacturers. So refer to the manufacturer's information that comes with each door leaf, and that contains all that information and what products should have been fitted to the door. In the case of the RRO, the fire and rescue services are the people who are responsible for monitoring and checking that fire risk assessments have been undertaken by the building owner or the responsible person. If that hasn't happened, then they are entitled to serve a notice upon you to make sure that you then carried out that fire risk assessment. And again, if that doesn't happen, then you are liable to be prosecuted. And there are many, many cases these days where hotel owners, property owners, um, various office people who are responsible persons have been prosecuted or even sent to jail for not undertaking that responsibility. It's important that the specifier and user of a fire door checks the information that's re relevant to that fire door because, as you see from this slide, the, fire ev the test evidence should relate to the complete installed assembly. A fire door assembly, as we've heard before, will be the door and its frame and all of the hinges and other components that are fitted to make it what we call a fire door assembly. It's the whole assembly that has to be properly certificated. And if there are any small differences in, in changes to those, um, that fitting, then that can have a significant effect on the rating of the fire door. In other words, if you don't fit the correct intumescent seals, if you don't fit the correct door frames, if you don't fit the correct ironmongery, you can significantly affect the rating of the fire door. That's particularly the case and particularly relevant to glazed apertures. So back to the building regulations. In the new building regulations, doors are required for either dwelling houses or other types of buildings. In, in the case of dwelling houses, fire doors are required in those houses that have got an integral garage, houses that are what are called large dwelling houses, or in loft conversions. And each of those regulations will specify what type of fire door requirements are needed for those particular projects. The same applies to other than dwelling houses, and that includes flats, mixed-use buildings, hotels, shops, schools, and all the other types of 
public buildings that we're aware of. So most buildings in the UK need to have fire doors. What the regulations say is that all doors have got to have the appropriate performance requirements, and that is they must be tested to BS 476 Part 22 or the BS EN equivalent, BS EN 1634. All fire doors must have a self-closing device, except in the case of dwelling houses or where fire doors are required to be locked. There are situations where fire doors need to be locked, such as in cupboard doors and, and, and those sort of applications, and they will be determined by the building regulations. There are other requirements as well, such as information about hinges, which should, for example, have a melting point of at least 800 degrees centigrade. That means you can't use materials like aluminium, which melts at a lower temperature. Hardware should be fitted to the, uh, uh, the Association of British Hardware Manufacturers Code of Practice. And all fire doors, with the exception of those in dwelling houses, have got to have appropriate fire safety signs, the little blue signs that we often see on a fire door. Okay, so that brings us to the end of part one of this training program. In part two, we'll be looking at how a door's performance is measured and what certification means. John, could you remind us why that's important? Yes, as we've heard in this first part, a door is not tested as a door leaf. It's tested as a complete fire door assembly, and it's that fire door assembly that has to be fitted into a building to make sure it complies with the building regulations. And in part two, we'll be looking at that and what, how that, dif uh, that assembly can differ uh, depending on the design and construction of the door. Okay, great. Thank you, John, and thanks for watching. We'll see you in part two.